Okay. Up until now, one of the things that we've done, is, basically the main thing that we've done, is to look at uh, low frequency behavior of the circuit. We started from device physics, we built it up to the circuit level, we built smaller circuits, and then we kind of understood the build, core building block from a low frequency perspective, and then we added more and more complexity, and we saw eventually that you can actually make pretty large circuits with 50 or so transistors or even more. Uh, made out of these units. And if you understand what they f their function is and how they interact with each other, then you can understand it, at least from a low frequency perspective. Now, we have stayed away from high frequency behavior, and today this is what's going to be doing, what we'll, we'll start doing. We'll start developing the tools and techniques to do high frequency things. So I want to say a few words about the technique that we are going to develop, which is what we call generalized time and transfer constants, or TTC. Um, so, the point, there are different ways to analyze a high frequency circuit, right? You can always write KCL and KVL or do the nodal analysis. You can always draw all the capacitors and all the inductors, all the reactive elements in it, and then you can just make a gigantic matrix and then try to invert it, and then you can essentially just find what the response of the circuit is that way. You can solve the nodal equations. That's good if you're a computer, and that's what computers do. It's not particularly useful or easy, but more, more importantly useful, if you're a human. If you're a human, what, what are you trying to gain out of this analysis? The purpose of the analysis, analysis is not valuable for the sake of analysis. Analysis is useful for design, right? So you want to have a method that gives you insight about what you need to change, and you understand what affects what how. And that's why we go and develop this method that will spend a fair amount of time to develop. But once you develop it, once you understand it, you can actually use it extensively to understand and analyze circuits in a way that's conducive to design. And by that, what I mean exactly, so what we'll see at the end of this process is that you have a method that you can get information about the frequency behavior of the circuit to the level of accuracy you want by putting sufficient amount of work in. So if you say, I want to know the first order answer, you can get it quickly. If you want to get information about second order things, you can put a little bit more work in there, and you get it a little bit more effort. And in the process, you can also define parameters in such a way that are meaningful in terms of design, and you can develop some intuition about what gives rise to poles and zeros and why they move the way they do, uh, the way, and, and think what happens with them. So, so that's the background, but let's actually start doing real things for you guys to see what happens. So a little bit in the way of review. So the first thing is that if you, it really goes back to the linear circuit analysis, right? The concept of linear circuits is simple. So you basically, if you have a, a box view, if you say you have an X and a Y, and this box, it, let's think it's like an operator. It takes an input waveform and generates an output waveform, right? Now, how, does, how do these relate to each other? What happens is that if you have a, so y of t, really, is this box, you can think about it as an operator, O, operating on the input x to produce the output y. So it, you take, it takes the input x and produces output y. And what happens is that if you do this, so the question is that what's going to happen to this? In general, this is going to be, um, what happens is that this is going to be an arbitrary input, right? And when you have an arbitrary input like that, you can write any arbitrary input in various bases. One of the bases that's commonly used is the basis of impulses. So you can express it as x of tau delta of t minus tau d tau. So this is review, really, right? And delta is the Dirac delta, right? which basically has an area of 1 and is 0 at all points except for 0. And x of t, x of tau, now the difference here is that this is really like a lookup table. This is a way, this is a continuous lookup table. You basically have these values and say, okay, I put this, I multiply this impulse at this exact point by this value. I multiply the next one by this value. And of course, there's, there's a d tau to make sure it scales properly. And you just put them, you're putting a bunch of impulses next to each other with different values with the lookup table. So what that make does is that it makes the only thing that's really a function of t this function. So this is the only function. Now, if you plug that into the system, what you will get is, so the operator operates on this, so I'm going to use this 
expansion. This is called the sifting property of the delta sometimes. And when you use this expansion, you have the operator operating on this. But the only thing that's in this thing is a function of t is the delta, right? So if that operator is linear, then you can actually apply it to what's inside the integral. So now here there's an assumption on this equality, which basically says linearity, right? If it's linear, then you can say this is the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of x of tau, operator operating of delta of t minus tau, d tau, right? And now this thing, what is this thing? This is the response of the system to an impulse at time t equal tau, right? So time t equal tau, if you hit it with an impulse, uh, what happens is that then you get, this is the impulse response you will get. So we will show that impulse response with, in general as x of t and tau, because h of t and tau, because it could depend on t and tau. Depends on when you inject it, and as well as, that of course, it will have its own time dependence. It will be a function of time, what, whatever comes out, right? Now, so that's what will you get at this point, and this is called the superposition integral. Sometimes people call this the time, time variant convolution. I don't like that, um, because convolution is a very specific operation. So, so this is what we call the superposition integral. Now, what happens after this is that now, if your system, so then there's a second condition that we impose on the system. We can say that now, if the system is also time invariant, oh, not, not line invariant, time invariant, right? Which means that the response of the system does not depend, uh, the, the, the way the system responds, more accurate, the way the system responds does not change with the time of application of the impulse. That's the better way of saying it. And why did I make that distinction? Because if I say that this, the response does not change with time, it means that the response is always this, happening at the same time, right? Now, and because of that, Basically, then that h of t and tau becomes h of t minus tau. Now, you may say, why h of t minus tau? Why isn't it h of just t? You didn't say it's independent of time? Well, I said the way the system responds becomes independent of the time of application. So if I kick this table now, it will say it makes the noise now, right? If I kick it, a second later, it will make this, this noise a second later. So if I hit the system with an impulse here, the response would be something. Time invariant means that if I hit it at a later time, the response would be that something shifted by the same amount of time. That's why there's this shift. In fact, if the response did not change at all, it would make a very strange system. Because no matter when I kick it, it will make a noise at the same, at the, in an exact same time. Right? So if it would, you know, if I kick it now, it will make the noise now. But if I kick it, you know, if, if, if we kick it later, it would make the noise back, back then, right? So it has, they have to be shifted by the same amount for the system to be time invariant. So if the input shifts by some amount, the output needs to shift by set, that's the same amount. But it should look the same other than for the shift. And that's why there's the h of t minus tau. Now, this is convolution. And the way the convolution really works is basically one of the two, so if you have two waveforms that you're trying to convolve, if this is one and this is the other one, so, so one, what you do, you flipped one, so, and then you slide it across, so this one gets start moving, and you calculate the area of the product as it's moving. So this is T, and it starts moving, and I'm sure everyone's familiar with this, just as a review, but, it's basically, you take one, you flip it, and you slide it across, and then you move across. Um, it's also, the, the origin, the, the, this operation is sometimes also shown, so symbolically this is shown as x convolved with h, uh, with an asterisk. It was the original name of this operation, it was a German word called Faltung, which means folding. 
And then somebody wanted to be cool about it and said, oh, it's called convolution. I think Foltung is actually a better name. Because you're basically just folding it, sliding. Um, so anyway, so it's a mathematical operation. But what it does, it allows you to calculate the response of the system. This integral, or in short form, this thing, allows you to calculate the time domain response of the system to an LTI system, linear time invariant system, or LTI for short. So now we are assuming it's linear time invariant. Uh, for any arbitrary input, x of t, as long as you know one thing, it's impulse response. So if you know it's impulse response, you know everything there is to know about an LTI system. And you can calculate its input to any arbitrary, uh, to its output to any arbitrary input. Right? So that's very basic uh, part of this thing. Now, if you take this, and if there are different kinds of transforms you can perform on both sides of this equation. Uh, the easiest one from our perspective would be Laplace transform, which is basically a special, I mean, a special variation of the uh, application of the heavy side operator, which then, and, and a special case of Laplace transform is the Fourier transform. But anyway, so if you apply Laplace transform to both sides of this, so in short, basically what you have, what we have here is y, let me just write it this way, y is x convolved with h. Right? And if you apply Laplace transforms to both sides of this thing, so you can say L of y is Laplace transform of x. And one of the basic properties of Laplace transform, which is easy to show, essentially you define the, write the definition of Laplace transform, and then you switch the order of integration of the convolution and the Laplace, and then you get that, is that the Laplace transform of a convolution is what? Is the product of the Laplace transforms, right? Same thing is true about Fourier transform, because Fourier transform is a special case of Laplace transform. So this becomes L of x times L of y. Oh, sorry, L of h. So we can show these things with a new symbol. So we show them as y of s equals x of s times h of s. Right? And alternatively, you can write this as h of s being the ratio of the output. We can think about it as frequency domain or generalized frequency domain representation of the output to the generalized frequency domain representation of the input. This is called a transfer function. Now, you can see, what, why is this, what this, this quantity should not look very unusual or strange to you, right? We've been calculating similar, very special cases of this thing a lot recently. Give me an example of this, a special case of this calculation that we've done. Gain, right? Gain is an example of this thing. You took one output from one input. Give me another example of that. We've done that too. Just think, you need to think about it slightly differently. Output impedances, that's good. Or input impedances, right? Why are they transfer functions? Because their ratio, for example, an output impedance is the ratio of the output, if you define the voltage, let's say an input impedance, right? If you define the voltage of that port as the output and the current driving that port as the input, the ratio of that voltage to, to that current, it can be of the same port or a different port in general, is defined as a input impedance, right? So you have to keep in mind, they can be voltages of current of the same or different ports in circuit domains, right? And if they are of the same port, they would define impedances or admittances. And we'll talk about when it's an impede impedance and when it's an admittance. It has to be precise, that definition, for everything to work properly. But this is basically the transfer function. So it's, a, it's kind of a generalized gain, right? I write it as generalized gain. That's what it is. Now, the beauty of this thing is that, so you have a time domain representation of the system, which is the impulse response. And you have a frequency domain, this generalized gain property of the system, and they're related through a very simple relationship, right? 
the relationship is that capital H of S is Laplace transform of the, the time domain impulse response. And then you can think about the input and output also in terms of in the frequency domain, x of s and y of s. So that's a very basic, I mean, this is something that's a review for everyone here, but it's just making sure that we're on the same page. So that's very basic definition of a system transfer function. Any questions on this? All right, it's clear? Good. OK, so now if you have a transfer function of this sort, so this is generally true, what we said. It doesn't even have to be an electrical circuit or something like that. As long as an LTI system, there are many, many different kinds of circuits that can be represented this way. Now, if you have a lumped electrical circuit, by lumped meaning that it's made out of components that are all small, much smaller than the wavelength, right? you actually have circuits, then you will, you, this transfer function, you can show that this transfer function, and if it's an LTI system, this transfer function can be written in this form. So it would be basically in, in a rational form. So you will have a ratio of two polynomials in S. The numerator would be going up to m, and the denominator would be written in this form. So, and there would be finite number of terms if you have a lumped circuit, meaning that you have a finite number of inductors and capacitors and things of that sort in, in conjunction with a large, any number of resistors and dependent sources and independent sources and everything, right? And again, these things can be ratios of various parameters. They can be ratios of voltages of, let's say it can be ratio of one port voltage to another port voltage. They can be the ratio of one voltage to another current. It can be the voltage of one port to the current of the same port, or it can be the voltage of the current of that port to the voltage of that port. And in the first case, it would be defined as an impedance. In the second case, it would be defined as an admittance and things of that sort. So, so but in general, we also know something else. So, so if you look at this form, this form is particularly actually useful for what we call a low pass response. And why do we mean by low pass response? If you look at the Bode plot, in other words, if you look at the 20 log of h of j omega, so if you set s to being j omega, and plot it versus log of omega, this, this kind of response is good when you have something that has the highest gain at low frequencies. Generally, this representation is good for that. And what is this low frequency gain? What is this value here, if you look at it? What is it? A0, exactly, right? So it is A0 because if you set all the s's to 0, that would correspond to dc. Because this corresponds, it's the j omega of 0, right? When omega is 0, and then therefore it's So this value is A0. I mean, of course, on this plot, it would be between the log of A0, but we just show it as A0. And one of the parameters that generally we are interested in is what we call the omega 3 dB. The frequency at which this drops by 3 dB. Or some, we show it also here with omega H a lot of times. Now, why do we care about the 3 dB? Why is the 3 dB thing important? Yes? 3 dB corresponds to the, um, the amplitude being had. Well, the power being half. The amplitude is square root of 2, actually, right? Because 6 dB would be, this is 20 log, right? So a factor of 2 would correspond to 6 dB. So it's where the amplitude is actually dropped by square root of 2. But since power is proportional to amplitude square, that corresponds to a power of 1 half, an amplitude of square root of 2 drop. So 3 dB corresponds to that kind of ratio. So that's very important. This is sometimes called the bandwidth of the system. Right? And we say, if you say such and such system has a band, with such an, the bandwidth of my amplifier is 5 gigahertz, it means that generally what pe when people say that, they mean that it's basically this frequency that's this omega h is, well, or omega h is 2 pi times 5 gigahertz. Right? Because this is the angular frequency, it's 2 pi times f. 
So that's a very important parameter, and we'll spend a fair amount of time trying to calculate that in the things we do, this kind of frequency. So a lot of times, we'll spend a lot of time trying to estimate or calculate what the frequency, the 3dB frequency of a given circuit is. Because we are trying to, for example, push it, push it up, making it, because that would determine the speed of the, the response of the system, right? In the, first, in the first order system, this frequency, one over this omega, is actually the time constant of the system in the first order system, right? And that's why it's important. So we'll spend a lot of time thinking about that. Now, if you have this form, this is a kind of a polynomial form, fine. If you're a mathematician, this is a nice thing to do. But there's another way of writing this, which also is interesting if you're a mathematician, but uh, is that you can actually factor this. Why can you factor this? What, what is the thing that says that you can factor it, and what is that thing? There is something that comes from math that tells you that you, it can be factored properly, right? What is it? The fundamental theorem of algebra, right? The fundamental theorem of algebra says any polynomial, nth order polynomial, in general, with complex coefficients, can be factored as product of first order terms with complex terms. Also, and a corollary of it is that any polynomial with real coefficients, in this case, let's say if it's a real circuit, it would generate real coefficients, can be factored in terms of first and second order polynomials with real coefficients. Right? This is very important because it says that no matter how complex this combination is, you can think of it as a bunch of first and second order systems. And we'll see that more explicitly in a few minutes. This enables you to think about these in terms of systems that don't become more complex than anything second order. It's an aggregate of those, but it allows you, and that's why we spend a lot of time studying first and second orders in more fundamental classes, the basic physics classes, or you know, the circuits classes, things of that sort, right? Okay, so when we do that, you can actually have a different factorization. You can actually factorize it this way. You can write it as one minus S over Z1 times 1 minus s over z2 all the way to 1 minus s over zm divided by 1 minus s over p1, 1 minus s over p2, all the way to 1 minus s over pn. Why did we write it this way? Why is, what's the advantage of writing it this way? Because I could have written it as s minus z1 times s minus z2 times s minus z3 in the numerator and you know, s minus p1, s minus p2, et cetera, et cetera, in the denominator. Right? It, would have been, it would have looked less complex. So you can pull the DC transfer exactly. You can pull the DC transfer function out. And if you set s to 0, you will see this entire thing becomes 1. So that's a normalized part. And then you have just a comp comp constant up front, the a0, the DC part, separated. And everything else, so you take, this is your DC gain. This is the kind of gain we've been calculating, right? Right? And all of the frequency behavior is lumped into this big chunk. So you separate them in that sense. I mean, it's, it may, it's not something profound. It's just something to think about why we do this. Now, the roots of the numerator, these Z1, Z2, Z3s, are called pole, zeros, sorry, Zi's are the zeros of the transfer function, and pi's are called the poles of the transfer function. Now, again, in a way of review, where, what, determines, what, are, what, what determines, for example, let's say, the poles of the system? Now, this is an important, kind of subtle, but important discussion. What determines the poles of the system? Where do they come from? The roots of the denominator. Where do they come from? How do you calculate? What, what, what are they? What are they? Yeah. Uh, correct. The, the, the reactive elements would determine them, but they would also determine the zeros, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. That, that's great. That's exactly right. Uh, we're going to get there in quickly, but just so so here's here's the thing. The, the the key part is that, but if I wanted to calculate the poles of the system, they depend. Purely, there are the natural frequencies of the system. Why is that? There are different ways to see that. One way is to think about the, the 
y matrix, right? So in general, if you have a, you know, you can write y times v, any circuit can be described as this kind of thing. So these are vectors and this is the y matrix, right? This is the basis of nodal analysis. So if you want to calculate the node voltages, for example, or the unknowns, you do a y matrix inversion. You have to invert the y matrix, right? How do you invert a matrix? Well, you calculate the cofactor matrix, but you divide it by what? The determinant, right? So this thing, this y inverse, is basically the cofactor matrix divided by the determinant of y. So the roots of the denominator of the transfer function, these roots, are in fact the roots of this equation. Because that's what the denominator of the transfer function looks has, right? So they are determined really by the way this, the interconnection of the circuit and the elements, they are, the way they are connected. So it's a natural frequency of the system. It, the, now, and here's the and it, point, point one, which is what uh, Nikhil mentioned earlier, is that it's, this does not depend on the choice of the input and output. Meaning that if I take my input from somewhere else and an output from somewhere else, let's say if I change where I'm taking my output from this point and that point, the roots of the natural, fre the natural frequencies of the circuits are not a function of where I look, right? As long as they are all interconnected. If they are separated from each other, what happens is that they are still the natural frequencies of the system, and we'll talk about that, but there would be zeros that will come and cancel them, separate them. But here's the thing. These are fundamental properties of the circuit independent of the choice of the input and output. Now, there's a, little, there's a subtlety here. This is an important subtlety from a circuit's perspective. When I say choice of the input and output, I mean where you're taking the input or output. Now, but if you switch your input from a current source to a voltage source, or you, if you change the nature of your input, right? If you, you're driving a circuit, let's say a network, with a current source, and you get you got some natural frequencies. If you switch this to a voltage source and drive the same circuit, it can change your natural frequencies. The reason is that it changes the Y matrix. Because it changes the way the things are interconnected. Because this, from a circuit perspective, when this value is nulled, this is an open. Right? This is a short when it's nulled. So it is kind of like thinking, if you want to think about it, is that this one leaves these terminals open and this one shorts these terminals. So when I say the choice of the input and output, I mean where you're taking your output or where you're applying your input. But if you take something, that, if you had a voltage source somewhere and take it and put it somewhere else, what you've done is that that port was effectively shorted. Now you've made it open and that port that was open before now is shorted. So you have changed the interconnection of the circuit. Because this can cause a lot of confusion if you don't think about it properly. But apart from that, if the, the, the interconnection is not changed, if I take my input from this port or look at this voltage or that voltage or you know, look at this input and define this as the input or define that as the output, should not change the natural frequencies. Yes, Noel. That's an excellent question. So, so the question she is asking is, if you change your output from a current to a voltage, let's say, let's say you define, you say I'm, I'm looking at the voltage or I'm looking at the current of a port. Would that change? The, you're, in general, you're asking, say, would that change the circuit and how would it do that? So you, you, you ask it kind of like add a second part to your question, which was would the poles become zeros and zeros become poles? Let's get to that in a second. But so, so Let's see. Let's say this is the output, and this is the output. So let's say the input is the same for these two. So let's say we keep both of them, I don't know, a voltage source. Right? So you have the same voltage source, but now you're trying to say, I'm trying, one time I'm measuring a voltage, and one time I'm measuring a current. My immediate question for you is that, how do you measure the current? And how do you measure the voltage? Right? If your answer is, 
Oh, okay. I put an ideal voltmeter here and an ideal ammeter here. So ask, let me ask you a question. Do you think the poles will change? What is, what is an ideal voltmeter from an impedance perspective? It's an open circuit. And what's an ideal ammeter? Short circuit. Have you changed the Y matrix? Yes. So the poles will change. Right? Now, if you come back and tell me, no, 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 that's not what I'm doing. I have a resistor there. I have a 50 ohm resistor, for example. There's nothing magical about 50 ohm. Just, yeah. To show that there's nothing magical, you just make it 10 ohms. Okay. 10 ohm resistor, right? And I, one time I look at the voltage across this guy, and that, I define that as the output. The other time I look at the current through here, and I define that as the, as the uh, output. Now what? It, are the poles going to change? No. Do you see the difference? Is it clear? Yeah. So, so that, that's, now, but in general, it doesn't flip the poles and zeros. It just changes them. We'll, we'll see when that happens, but this is not the scenario. We'll, we'll sh I'll show you this, the scenario that later on. Something like that. Something like that. When you calculate impedance and admittance and things of that, so sometimes this can happen, but you have to be careful about it. Because then also the choice, you have to be careful not to, to inadvertently change the nature of the, the Y matrix in the process of the way you're defining these things. Okay, any other questions? All right. Okay. So let's continue. So this is, this is an important and subtle thing, right? So this representation is interesting. So now if you look at this representation, oh now how about zeros? Now unlike poles, zeros are in fact functions of what you define as the input and the output. So even if I don't change the network, if I define for example this voltage or this current as the, as the output, the, the zeros of the system can change. I may actually use a third port and you say, oh, you know what? I'm looking at the voltage across this thing instead of this voltage. Now, if you look at, if you define this as your output and this as your input, so you get a different transfer function. Let's call this H2, and H2 of S. And then let's say this original transfer function, let's call it H1 of S. What can you say about the relationship between H1 of S and H2 of S? So H1 of S is defined in this case as you know, V1, and let's call this V2 and V0 or V in. H1 of S is defined as V1 divided by V in, and H2 of S is defined as V2 over V in, right? So if I define these two, what can you tell me about the poles of H1 and H2? They're equal, right? They're the same. They're the same poles. What can you tell me about the zeros? Not much. You can't tell me much. At least I can't tell you much. Maybe you can tell me something. <laughs> I can't tell you much about it. Just, uh, it. It would be a bunch of the zeros will generally be different. Now, if some make, if I make some pathological circuit that it can be the same, maybe I don't know, you can try to contrive one. <laughs> but uh, yeah. right. So that's important. Zeros uh, poles are fundamental properties of the network. Zeros should depend on the choice of the transfer for input and output. And you will see, when we derive these expressions, you will see that these inductive expressions, these multi-level iterative expressions that we will define, have, for poles, have no, de no dependence on the choice of the input and output. And for zeros, they have this parameter, which we'll call the transfer constants, that do depend on the choice of the input and output. Okay, so, so let's continue. So to continue, so there's one more thing that you can tell from looking at this expression, right? What else can you tell? Look, look, what is the relationship between these P's and B's and A's and Z's? Can we talk about that? Let's start with the poles and the B's, right? What is B1 in terms of the poles? Can you tell me what it is? Sum of one over the, all the poles, almost. They're almost there. 
you're on the other side of it, you need a mirror. Minus, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, you can see, if you multiply all these out, the first order term would be, would have one over P1, negative one over P1, negative one over P2, negative one over P3. So B1 is negative sum of all the PIs. Right. So now, a lot of times when you see me writing these sums, you, see, you may see me drop the beginning and the end of the index. Right? Because normally this is defined as 1 to n. Right? So if you see me drop this, it just means that over all of them. Right? In physics, sometimes they just drop the sign too. Right? They just basically, well, it wouldn't work here. You have to have an index repeated twice. When you have an index repeated twice, it basically means that it's summed over that in a lot of places. But we won't do that. We'll keep the sums, just for clarity. Um, but yeah, and then, OK, so that's B1. How about B2? What is B2 in terms of P, P's, PIs, P1, P2, PIs? What is it? Sum of every pair. OK, every pair? Well, every pair, right? I mean, flipping doesn't count. So, so if you have the one, two, you shouldn't have two, one, right? You add basically. If you have three, it would be p one two one over p one p two one over p one p three and one over p two p three. You don't want to double count p three p two, and you don't have a p one p one, right? So how do we show that in our slightly shorthand notation? Say pi, pj, i, and j, i smaller than j. Right? Keep i smaller than, if you can think about it as a, like a line of programming. It's two nested loops. For i equals 1 to, to n, for j equals i plus 1 to n, right? Because so your starting point is not one for the second loop. If you write the C code or whatever. So that's that sum. Does it make sense? So we can keep writing them. There will be three way sums, et cetera, et cetera, all the way, all the way to Bn. What is Bn? One over the product of all of them with. Yeah, the sign is depends on whether n is odd or even, right? So it becomes negative 1 to the power of n to get the right sign, p1, p2, all the way to pn. Right? And you can write exactly a parallel composition for a's, right? The only difference is that now, because you have this a0 up front instead of a 1, all of these things become the ratios. So here becomes a1 over a0 is negative sum of all the zeros. And a2 over a0 becomes the double sum ij, i smaller than j of 1 over z, i, z, j. And all the way down to a m over a0 would be negative 1 to the power of m, p, um, sorry, z1, z2, all the way to z m. Right? That's the way they look. We really actually end up worrying about really this and this and maybe that. Because there's these middle terms, usually we don't kind of worry about them a lot. We'll see why. But again, and that's why I didn't write them. But you can write them. You can express them as a three-way sum. I mean, if you wanted to kind of do that, it would be i, j, k, p, i, p, j, p, k, i smaller than j smaller than k. Right? And so on and so forth. Um, OK, so, so these are like some basic variations of this format. One of the questions is that, so this is, all in this is all general, right? Now let's say we make one more assumption. The assumption here is that, let's say you have one dominant pole. So let's say you have a dominant pole. So let's say meaning, meaning that P1 is much smaller than P2 
much smaller than P3, and so on and so forth. So the pulls are happening at kind of like frequencies that are far apart from each other. So first one happens, you have a pole here, and then you don't have a pole for a while, and then you have another pole, and then something like that. And let's say that we don't have much zeros there. Uh, and even if you do, that doesn't matter. But so in that case, can you tell me something about the relationship between B1 and P1? Or P's, not P1, in general, P's. If there's one that's dominant. So if P1 is much larger than P2, much smaller than P2, much smaller than P3, what dominates this term? Yes. P1, right? So in that case, B1 is roughly 1 over P1. Oh, oh the lines. Right? And then you can say B2 is going to be roughly what? What is B2 going to be? A proxy. Negative, negative P2 over P1, right? Do you see that? Is it clear? Because you're factoring, so, so let's say, if you say that my first dominant one is 1 over B1, you're factoring 1 over Bs from, from this entire thing. If you factor the 1 over Bs from this, then this first term becomes, these two become 1, right? And then you will have a B2 over B1. And then you are in a similar situation with one reduced order. And you can keep going. So again, these are some background of calculations that would be helpful in some of the things we do later. So it's just good to understand. But now let's continue this discussion a little bit more and then go through a so if you look at this, uh, this factorization, right? if you have this factorization, you can do also something else. You can actually write it. This is all products right now. right? Everything is just products. But if we, we can write them as sum of products, of simpler products, right? in particular, there's something we can do which is called partial fraction expansion. What do you, what do you get when you do partial fraction expansion of something like this? If you do partial fraction of expansion of this, what kind of terms would you get in general? Yes? A sum of terms over individual, um, individual pulses. Correct. And so you can either do it in this form, which would basically, if you keep everything like this, this would be in general, if these coefficients are real, these first order terms would be what? Either real or will come in complex conjugate pairs, right? Because we said you could factor them in terms of real coefficients of first and second co coefficients. So these either will be real, or they come from a second order one with real, which would give you a pair of complex conjugate pairs. So if they are complex, they will have to be in pairs complex conjugates. They can't be standalone complex if these coefficients are real to begin with. And if they are not complex, they're not complex, they're first order. So in general, then, we can actually write this, another way to write this is to write it as a product of first order and second order real terms. Right? We can always do that. If you started with real, you can do it in that form. And if you do that and do a partial fraction expansion of that, on that, you can in fact rewrite this as h of s as a bunch of first and second order terms. Right? So you will, for example, have a k1 over 1 minus s over, let's say, um, pa, or let's call it ka. I think that's what I called it, yeah. And then you can write the next one. These are for the, that's the first order ones, right? kb, 1 minus s over pb, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then you will have a bunch of second order ones, right? Let's call it kx, um, or whatever, k, k, I don't know. X is fine. Um, and then these are going to be second order ones, which you can write in the following form. Uh, you can write it as 1 plus 1 over Qx um, S over P, uh, uh, or sorry, omega X plus S squared over omega X squared. Then you can have a Ky 
1 plus 1 over qy, s over omega y plus s squared plus, I'm sorry, actually this is, yeah, the, the numerator would be kx times 1 minus some s over zx in general. That can be a first order pole, a zero. Yeah. Okay. Y, 1 over 1 times 1 minus s over zy, etc., etc., and going on. So this may look complex, but it's not, not much. I mean, complex. I mean, it's a bunch of, it's a partial fraction expansion of this thing. In terms of first order real terms in the denominator and second order real terms in the denominator, which we can write this way to make it more meaningful. Yes? Going back to the dominant whole thing. Sure. Well, you're right. Actually, this is an error. The reason is that this is just a mistake. Thank you for pointing it out. So this should be P1 over P. Wouldn't it be 1 over P1, P2, just looking at the... 1 over P1, P2. Oh, you mean, right, this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One over P1, P2. Oh, you mean, right, this one? Yeah. But then all the terms that have the P1 would be dominant. I mean, if you factor it, you will see it better. It's an approximation, right? If you, if you make this P1 substantially larger than P2, oh, I'm sorry, P2 substantially larger than P1 in magnitude, right? So what happens is that when you factor the P1, the only term that will be left out of this one would be the P2 one. Not clear. Maybe we can talk about it offline. Okay. Yeah, okay. We, we can look at it. Maybe, maybe. maybe there's something there. But just, I think, I think it's correct. It, regardless, this is the one we use most of the time. But anyway, we'll look at this together afterward. Make sure that. OK. So let's go back here. And um, OK. So where were we? Yes. So here, if you have this thing written as sum of the first and second order terms, right? You have sum of first order and second terms. So why are you doing this? Why are you making this more complex? Right? Why are you making this more complicated? Wasn't it nice the way it was in the beginning, like with the, in this form? Why are you making it more complex and then more complex and like that? Why are we doing this? Right, so you can actually see the response of these systems independently, and you can write the overall system response of the system as the sum of these, right? So now you've broken something that was a bunch of products into some of smaller products or smaller systems. And the good news is that we actually know generally the response of systems of this nature. It's a first and second order system. So if you do this, you know everything to know there is to know about any nth order system. Because you can break it into first and second order systems. And what are those? Again, as a point of review, so imagine that you have a, so what are the impulse responses of systems with various poles? So if you look at the the S plane, this is sigma and j omega, is the real and imaginary part of the pole values. You can have poles at different locations, right? You can, for example, have a pole at the origin. If I have a single pole, at, a system with a single pole at the origin, what is the impulse response? Basically, it's an H of S, which is 1 over S, right? What is that? What is the impulse response of that? The a, if the h of s, so that basically, this is what this corresponds to, right? 1 over s. What's the impulse response? What is the system? What does the system do? What is the system? It's an integrator, right? It's an integrator. It's an ideal integrator from negative infinity to t. What is the integral from negative infinity to t of an impulse? It's the step, right? Because if t is smaller than 0, you, you, you have nothing to integrate. There's nothing. If you get, once you get past zero, you have the area of one, the area of the impulse included. So the impulse response of a, the, 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 the impulse response of the system would be a step, a unit step function, U of t. So if I draw the impulse response here, let's say roughly, it would look like that, U of t. So if that's a system that that's the only pole it has, this is the way it will look like, right? What if I had a system with a single pole here? So this is not here. So these are not happening at the same time. Right. So this is like 
I'm going to draw a bunch of different things here so on this plot, but they're not all happening at the same time. So it's either or kind of thing. So what is this system? What is this in S plus some tau, right? Or S plus 1 over tau, really. Um, but anyway, S plus some omega. What is this? It, it's a, it, you, you said it's, repeat it again? Decaying exponential. Decaying exponential, right? So the impulse response of this thing, kind of like it starts decaying at some rate exponentially, right? And then if the pole was down here instead of there, what would change? It would decay faster, right? So this would look like that. Or I can make it even more exaggerated to make the point. Right? Now, if I go the other direction, what happens? If I had a pole here, what would that, what's the impulse response of that? It's a growing exponential, right? So it would look like this. And what if it was farther down here? just grow faster. Right? So uh, that's the spectrum of this thing. I mean, so that, that's basic. You can see there's a continuum, right? You can see nothing all of a sudden changes when you move this pole a little bit to the left, right? Instead of just being flat, it starts kind of like becoming a little bit sloping down or going down, or if you move it that way, it starts going up, and the farther you move it, it becomes steeper. There's no sudden change in the behavior. There's no phase transition, right, if you're a physicist. Okay, so now, here, so, so this is, these are one simple category of poles, right? What if I, have, yes, no, sorry? Sigma is the real part of S, right? So basically, S is defined, S is sigma plus j omega. So this is the real part, this is the imaginary part. We usually show them as sigma and omega, this common notation. There's nothing magical about it, it can be A and B, but that's a common notation in, for second order systems or higher order systems, but yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right, so now let's imagine that we have an imaginary, ima the imaginary pool, right? Purely, ima can I have a single imaginary pool like this? No, right? They have to come in complex conjugate pair. So if I look at, for example, one of these, what would I see? I see a pair of complex conjugate pair. Uh, well, if, if, it, if it didn't have the second term, if it, this was gone, then you get pure imaginary, right? Because if you have that middle term, then you will get complex. But if you add just this, you will get pure imaginary poles at plus minus omega x, right? J omega x. So this would be a j omega x. And you also have a zero here in the denominator. So what is the impulse response of this combination, which is this guy without the middle part? Yeah. OK, sine, it's sinusoidal. It's a cosine, right? So if you look at this, it will kind of look like this, right? So this is for this combination. It's not just for this guy. I'm just putting it here. Right? What if these were farther out? So again, these two poles now with this zero. It would be a cosine, but oscillating faster. So the impulse response looks like this. It goes from zero, jumps up here, and it, stay, it starts going like that. You still see the continuum. Because if you start taking these two and the zero and bringing down here to where this is. So you have two poles and a zero, so it becomes like a one, zero, one pole. So then it basically it becomes like a sinusoid that whose period is infinity. So it basically this beginning does never ends, right? Just like you just keep going. So you can see the beginning of it looks like the step, right? And the, lo the lower the frequency is, the longer that beginning will last. So again, the continuum exists. So now, of course, you can imagine I'm going to do next. So I'm going to put Let's say you have a pair of poles here and a zero. So this is the full, this is this full expression, right? What would happen then? What would it look like? It get, decaying sinusoid. You should be, it should be some sort of a combination of these two, right? Hence my choice of color, right? In a way. If you think about it, it would be 
This is just the envelope, just to emphasize that. And of course, if I have them on the other side, you can imagine what's going to happen, right? Say sinus, it's an exponentially growing sinusoid. So this picture essentially has all the possible responses that a linear system can produce. It's the sum of a bunch of these for any LTI system. Any L LTI system of any arbitrary order would produce responses that's a, that's a linear combination of, of these, a weighted sum of these, and nothing else. Well, there are some variations. I mean, so, yes, of course, if you don't have this zero, then you will have a sine wave starting from here as opposed to a cosine, but they're essentially similar things. There are some, uh, well, there is one little other thing. So if you have double poles, for example, right? If you have two poles here at the origin, you can, you can do that in a different color. So if you had a double pole, yeah. right? Then you will get the ramp, because it's double integration. If you had a double pole here, let's put it here, or let's put it here, what you will get is that you will get the beginning of the ramp, but then you will get the exponential decay. There's this degenerate cases, too, that you can think about. But essentially, that's, those are the kind of things you can get. Right? So this is a useful thing. Anyway, a useful way to think about it. OK. One more thing before we wrap this conversation up is that this representation that we had here, this representation, right, is good for a low-pass system, right? Meaning something that has gain and low frequencies. I mean, there are lots of systems like that. Some of the op-amps that design, we designed were like that, right? I mean, they had gain at low frequency, but they didn't have much gain. At, the gain starts dropping. But not all systems are like that, right? There are systems, for example, that maybe band pass or high pass. Right? And this representation is not great in that, because in those cases, what is A0? If you have a band pass system or low pass system, it could be like zero, right? Or some, some insignificant value. It may not even be, even if it's not zero, it may not matter as much. So what would matter, let's say, for example, in the case of a band pass system? So let's say you have a band pass system. So let's say you do have something it looks like this. It's a bandpass system, right? Versus, so this is log of omega. This is tw the tw the log base 10 of h of j omega, et cetera, et cetera. All of that stuff. So it's like if you're looking at the Bode plot. What is the constant that really matters to you in this case? What, is, what value, where does it matter? The value of gain at what point is the most important thing to you if you have a bad pass? In the middle, right? That, that, this region. So we call this A mid because it's the middle of the band or something like that, right? And that's what you really kind of like want to express everything in terms of. Not A0 right? at 0. It may be 0. It may be some small amount. It doesn't really matter. So then you needed to kind of come up with a slightly different variation of this, right? Because this is good for low pass, but you want to kind of like modify. So what is that modified form? That modified form is something like this. So it's the same h of s in terms of a's and b's, but it's written in this form. So you can write as 1 minus z over s. 1 minus z2 over s, all the way to 1 minus zk over s, divided by 1 minus p1 over s. One mi oh, come on. I'm not being very economical here. I'm going to run out of space.
1 minus z1 over s, 1 minus z, z2 over s, 1 minus zk over s, and then 1 minus p1 over s, 1 minus p2 over s, blah, 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 1 minus pk over s, times a mid, times 1 minus s over zk plus 1, 1 minus s over zk plus 2, all the way to 1 minus s over zm, and then here's 1 minus s over pk plus 1, 1 minus s pk plus 2, all the way to 1 minus s over p n. Right? So what did we do here? What we did, we took a bunch of stuff and inverted them, all of these poles and zeros that are here, but these are upside down. You can see that they're written this way. These actually sometimes can be called the inverse poles and inverse zeros. Right? I mean, it's a, it's a different representation of the same thing, but you can actually think of these as, and they, they, what they do is interesting. These guys are responsible for this part of the behavior. And these guys, these poles and zeros, are responsible for this part. So you're separating what's causing that low cutoff and high cutoff. And this is a good thing, because the more you can divide, the better chance you have to conquer. So you're trying to break them up, split them into smaller pieces that you can attach. right? So here's the thing. It's, these are called inverse poles and zeros. Let's start with the regular ones first, and then we'll get to the reverse. So, so what this means is that there's a pole on this axis. There's a, there may be a pole, pole, zero, pole, pole, whatever, like zero, et cetera, et cetera. So these guys are represented here. But then here you have these things that kind of behave like that. So what are inverse poles and inverse zeros? What do they do? So regular poles and regular zeros, so this is what the regular pole does to amplitude, right? And this is what the regular zero does to amplitude. If you have a single zero or single pole in a Bode plot, this is a single pole, this is a single zero, right? What do reverse poles and inverse poles and inverse zeros do? They look, show the, do the mirror image of a pole. So an inverse pole does this, and an inverse zero does this. So this is a pole, this is a zero, this is an inverse pole. This is our notation for it. If, it if you want to see where, where it's coming from, this is the denominator of that. I mean, just notationally, I'm right. And this is that inverse zero. So each one of them generates one of these responses, and each one of these generates these responses. So you can separate them into two independent groups. So, and this way it's simple to kind of understand what an inverse pole and inverse zero does. Whatever the regular pole does, just like the x-axis is flipped, is mirror imaged. And there's a little subtlety here if you can tell the relationship between a zero and a mid, it doesn't matter, it's in the handouts and so that's, that's the core of it. So this allows us to analyze this separately from these. The more you can break it up into smaller pieces, the better off you are. So that's it for now, for this. Any questions?